Hi, everyone. I am just going to go ahead and get our YouTube link activated. There we go. Always just a few little things that we have to do, um, getting used to them. But this is just fabulous that we're able to do this every month. I'm so happy that you're able to join me. Welcome to another month of um, Crystal Conversations with me. Uh, it's a great time to be able to have some live conversation around the questions that come up for you as you are working with gemstones and crystals for healing. I love getting the questions and it not only gives me a chance to learn more about the questions because there's that wonderful saying what you want to teach what, what you want to learn teach to somebody else so it's a great opportunity for me to go back and kind of revisit some of the different aspects of crystal and gemstone healing that i don't always work with every single day for those of you who are new to my work and may not be very familiar with me i'm mary jo feely I am the owner of Fourth Dimension Healing in Stillwater, Minnesota. And it's here at my healing practice that I have an energy healing and crystal healing and mentoring uh, and light language healing practice. And I can talk a little bit more about those at the end of um, this hour. I also am the director of the Center for Crystal and Healing Studies, which is my online school. And fortunately, I was able to do some really nice shifting of a number of my courses that I offer into an online blended format um, when COVID kind of rolled out a couple years ago. And so there will be links to both my healing practice and my online school um, below this video. And so if you're curious, uh, go ahead and check those out. Also, if you're new to this kind of monthly gathering, what I do is I put out the invitation for people to send me questions throughout the month that they have related to gemstone and crystal healing. There is so much information out there, and some of it can be really confusing, some of it is spot on, some of it is really quite bogus, honestly. And so I think this is a great format for you to be able to submit questions and also hear the questions others also are submitting. And little by little, we begin to gain knowledge, we begin to kind of um, create a, a working understanding of how to work with and utilize and partner with gemstones and crystals for healing purposes. I will be periodically checking the chat to see if anybody has um, dropped a chat into um, the chat box and I will certainly respond to those. And the other thing uh, I want you to know is that uh, if you're watching this live, you can always re-watch the replay that I will post to Facebook in the next few days. It just, sometimes it takes a day or two just to get it all um, sorted out with, um, sorry, not Facebook, to um, YouTube, okay? So I think we're going to go ahead and dive right in. I've gotten a lot of great questions. We may actually not be able to even get to all the questions today, and that's okay. I'll reach out to those who did submit the questions so that they can get their questions answered, uh, and then I will revisit next month. So the first question is, how does the energy release from the gemstones? You know, this is a really, really great question because when we hear about working with gemstones and crystals, um, and it may be that you have uh, yourself gotten some information or read or learned about how a particular gemstone or crystal can help with ABC or XYZ. And so I like to think about it a little bit more broadly rather than just doing a cookie cutter approach and saying, Every redstone does this, and every piece of quartz does that. Uh, there are several ways to address how it is that we are able to connect with the healing properties of the stone. And so again, that question was, how does the energy release from the gemstones? First and foremost, working with gemstones and crystals as part of crystal healing is an energetic, complementary, and alternative healthcare approach. 
So when I am thinking about how to work with stones, one of the first things I I'd like to think about is the actual structure of the stone itself. Crystals, are, not all minerals are crystals, not all gemstones are crystals. A crystal has to have an internal microscopic repeating structural pattern. And so when I'm thinking about how can we work energetically with a stone to help support the energetic connection that our own physical body and our energy body uh, is connecting with through the stone, taking a look at the structure of the actual crystal can be really helpful. So here's a piece of fluorite. And while this piece looks actually a bit chunkier than anything else, there are a few places where you begin to get a sense that this is a stone this is a crystal that has a cubic structure. So a cubic structure is going to be really solid. Um, it's going to have an equal base, sides, and height. And so when we think about that, there's a lot of, literally a lot of structure to it. And so we can work with that energetic pattern of the cubic system, the isometric system to support us. If I'm feeling really disconnected and wobbly, I can work with a stone that has a cubic structure because that will actually help support that more solidifying isometric structure that is an aspect of my energy field. So certainly taking a look at structure is a way of doing that. Um, here's another example of a piece of fluorite. This is an easier example of how you can take a look at more of that cubic internal structure. We can think about working with the color of a stone or the hue of a stone. And now behind me, I always have this little kind of hanging that represents the various energy centers or chakras that are part of our energy field. The lowest chakra typically is going to be around the tailbone, and that's going to be red. It's the root chakra, and it is about a grounding kind of solid aspect of our life. And so with that example I used just a few minutes ago, when I said I'm kind of having a wobbly kind of time in my life, very likely there is some root chakra support that is needed. So if I were to work with an isometrically shaped um, Stone and that also really supports that root chakra, that could be like a, a, a double benefit. And one of the first ones that pops into my mind, which I actually don't have with me this evening, is a piece of pyrite or fool's gold. Because it's isometric, it's very stabilizing, it can really help. So that's an example of how we can work with the chakras. When I'm talking about the chakras here, I want you to notice that it's like there's a rainbow body within us, right? There's this rainbow column that's red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, and violet way up at the top above our head. So if we take a look at working with the hues of uh, the gemstones and crystals, that can very much be helpful as well. And that can be a way to work with energetics. So when we think about this green, area up here representing this heart chakra. Um, this heart chakra is kind of the middle of our seven chakra column. We have three below and we have three above. And so green is typically a color that is associated with the heart chakra. And if we want to approach working with the energies of the stone to help support our own energetic balancing, which then of course leads to physical um, stability and physical balancing, we would work with a stone or stones that are green. So again, here we would be potentially working with a piece of fluorite, which in this case, we're not really identifying this stone as a, a anchoring isometric cubic structure that's very stable. We're working with it because of its um, the minerals within it that supports that green hue. Here is an example 
of a piece of calcite. Now, this is a piece of green calcite. Now, calcite, calcite has, as its name implies, has a lot of calcium in it. So we know that calcium can be really helpful for good cardiovascular health. It's good for muscles and bones and tissues too. And so while we may choose to work with this green calcite to support our green heart chakra, this energetic um, signature is moving out into other aspects of our energy field as well. Here's an example of a piece of malachite. So malachite is a stone that is really high in copper. And we know that copper can be very helpful with inflammation. Uh, I've said it before, perhaps even on one of my other videos where I remember uh, an uncle many years ago, he would always wear a copper bracelet and I would ask him about it. And he said it helped his um, arms not feel so sore. That would be an example of how some of that copper, which has anti-inflammatory effects, could be really helpful if we wanted to work with this particular green malachite, it would have this um, anti-inflammatory property. But it also has the green hue that's supporting that heart chakra. So I just had a chat pop in, so let's take a peek. How do the minerals and gemstones get to us? Is it from the different stones' vibration? That's a great question. In fact, working with the mineral itself within the stones is another way to be able to um, access the energetic. So for example, let me move a couple things. Here is an example of a piece of lapidolite. Now lapidolite is not green. So we're not taking a look at it from this aqua column per se but it has a lot of lithium in it. And lithium is very, very helpful for calm, calming the nervous system, helping anxiety subside. And when used, again, in a complementary fashion with other support, um, particularly if um, you're a person that may have some anxiety in their life, that might be one of the um, health situations that you uh, deal with from time to time. Working with a piece of uh, lapidolite could be really helpful. So the question here is, so how do the minerals get into the body? Different ways. Sometimes if we're holding the stone, it can be actually that there's a little bit of transmission through the skin. Um, sometimes I will have a stone on bare skin, but actually most of the time when I'm working with the gemstones and crystals for myself, as well as typically many of my clients, they may be holding some stones, but otherwise most of the rest of the time, those are these stones are placed on or around the body, typically with a piece of fabric of some kind um, between the person and the stone. So we have to recognize that there is a vibrational quality to every living thing. Every Every living being, whether it's a stone, whether it's a plant, whether it's an animal, or whether it's a human being, has an energetic signature that is unique to itself. And so when we work closely with the energetics of these stones, they're able to help shift. My sense is that those same um, minerals that are within us. So if we take a look back at this, malachite, the malachite with the high um, copper content, that this is going to be really helpful energetically to help align the um, energetic signatures of the copper that's already in our body. Everything has an energetic signature, and that's my, my belief and my experience as to how we're able to work with the gemstones and crystals in this way. So there's this vibrational quality. Another aspect of vibrational quality has to do with where along this chakra column does a stone resonate? We talked about how you can use the colors and that can be a way 
to associate particular gemstones or crystals with the different chakras. And also there are some stones that have particular vibrational qualities that are either much um, slower or really, really, really very high in frequency. And so that is going to determine where lands on the chakra column and in turn, what part of our physical body it's going to be able to support and what part of our emotional or mental or spiritual bodies as well. When I'm working with students and clients, I like to tease out the fact that when I work with emotional and mental aspects of health and well-being, I separate out emotional and mental into two sections, even though, of course, we're all interconnected. Uh, I separate those out because in my experience over the years, I have learned and experienced that where we hold our emotions is in a different place energetically within our energy field than where we hold our thought patterns. So if I'm working with an energetic um, approach to, let's say, anxiety, then that's a mental process. It certainly can lead to emotions of feeling um, um, despair or hopelessness or guilt and all kinds of different things can arise from that. The nature of anxiety is a thought process. It's going to be in a different location. And so we can take a look at how can we work with stones that are going to support that more energetic um, aspect of anxiety, which is going to be in a different place than um, the energy of um, foot pain. So I, I I'm hopeful that I'm giving you a sense. Please send me questions or pop back into the text if you or chat box if you need me to explain it better. We have this vibrational quality. You'll hear that there are stones that are really high vibrational, and you may wonder, well, what the heck does that mean? I actually brought one to act that I want to reference with another question, but I want to show it to you. This is Moldavite. So Moldavite is a tektite, and it is a stone that um, actually comes from a meteor. This particular type of uh, tektite came from the Czech Republic, and it is um, believed to have been formed when a meteor possibly slammed into the earth a very long time ago, and when it hit the earth, all of the sand and the other minerals within that aspect of the earth where it landed all splashed up and formed into these pieces of glass, essentially. Um, it's more than glass, but it is just flash, flash um, formed because of this high impact. So here we have a piece of Moldavite is green, so it certainly can support the heart chakra if we wanted to approach it that way. However, this is an extremely high frequency vibrational stone, so much so that it took me a long time before I could even work with this stone because it is so powerful. So that again is an example of frequency of the stone, whether it's a really high frequency that connects way up at the top of the chakras and even above the crown chakra, which is at the top of the head, or if it's a stone that really resonates down with the earth, the color may or may not match what the chakra perception is. So keep that in mind. And then another way, the final way I like to think about how we can work with those stones energetically is just by intuition. If you have three stones and you're kind of drawn to one of them, that's the one to work with. And then get to work with it and get to know what that's about. I have um, a video on my YouTube channel about how you can, um, what, it, what it means to work with a stone. And it was in the, one of the last two monthly live Q&As that we actually had a bit of a crystal meditation. So take a look at those and then reach out to me if you have other questions. And um, before I forget, I've just recently started a podcast and I'll be um, rolling that out as well with more um, episodes, but every episode will have a guided meditation. And some of those guided meditations will be working specifically with 
gemstones and crystals. So you, that's another um, option that you'll be able to take a peek at as well. So that was a, a really great question um, and one that I think could be, could really, we could talk about that a long time. Uh, checking the chat. Okay, so next question is really, boy, this is gonna resonate with each of us. How do you know the difference between a real stone and a fake stone? Well, that's loaded because you know what? Sometimes it's really hard to tell the difference. As you work with gemstones and crystals, you will get a sense of what they feel like. So for example, this is a piece of magnesite. A lot of magnesium, we know magnesium can be really helpful for bones and muscles and um, can be really supportive um, when we're talking about some of those uh, healing properties that really have to do with structural health. And at the same time, I know what magnesite feels like. And so when I saw this, I thought, oh, I know what this is. Because at first glance, is this a piece of wood that's been painted? Is this a piece of plastic? And so you have to handle a lot of stones. Now, I um, showed you the Moldavite. Um, a lot of fake Moldavite out there. Moldavite is incredibly expensive and very rare um, to the point where I don't carry it in my shop. It's just not realistic. I'm practical um, to carry Moldavite for me. So I would say that if you are um, looking for Moldavite, make sure you are one, ready for the Moldavite, and two, that you really are doing your research. Now here I want to show you a couple examples of amber. So this is a piece of um, blue amber and it is when I rub it, it gets warm. It has tacky actually. Um, it does not get stay cold. Okay. It's got a softness to it. That's real amber. Many years ago I was given this as a gift and it's not real amber, it's plastic. It doesn't mean it's not a wonderful gift, it's just that I can tell it's not getting warmer. It's still very, very much the same as every, it's very uniform, okay? Um, I actually have amber earrings in today, and a little bit of amber around here. Again, you can feel the tackiness right away. So you'll have to get to know what you're, purchasing, what you gifted, and like this was a gift. I love it. It's not real. It doesn't mean that it's any less of a gift. Now, there's another, a very common uh, process or practice that is done when it comes to working with um, stones that you need to tease out, and that's whether or not they've been dyed. Um, there are a lot of pieces of quartz that you'll see what appears to be like a clear piece of quartz with lots of crackles and different colors and they're very popular with kids. They're blues and they're pinks and they're greens and they're just these wild colors. And that's dyed crackled quartz. There's nothing wrong with it. You just know what you're getting. And um, another very common practice is to take a stone that is white called hololite and it's very soft and it readily accepts dye and then it can change to different colors. It's almost always going to be sold if it's been dyed as turquoise. So just be familiar with it. Now, this is this little necklace that I wanted to show you that I've had for a long time, and it has a lot of gemstones and crystals on it. It has lapis lazuli, it has coral, it has turquoise, it has tiger's eye, and it has um, dyed hololite. And so while it may be a little tricky for you to see, I'm going to see if you can see this. Um, my pardon. Here's a piece of turquoise. Not very uniform, very soft stone. Here's a piece of howlite. Howlite is going to be typically a white stone with black veins or very soft gray veins. And you'll have to learn to look for that because once you see it, you won't forget it. 
Again, there's nothing wrong with how light, the wonderful stone for healing. It has some wonderful properties, but not if you think you're buying turquoise. So look for reputable vendors. I know people ask me, where do I get my gemstones for my shop? And um, I've created and established relationships with vendors over the years worldwide. And so you just get to know who you can work with, and then they know who their sources are. There gets to a point where unless you're actually were there when that particular stone came out of the ground, that there is a trust factor, that you're um, hopeful that there's a sense of ethics involved in that. So that um, I think is a really great question. And, you know, when we buy stones online, don't be surprised if from time to time you kind of take a little bit of a hit. It's going to happen. We just want to be um, as realistic as possible about knowing what we're getting. There are some other man-made stones that doesn't mean that they're fake. You just want to know, is this glass, is this volcanic glass from um, lava or in a volcano, or is this glass that was just scrapped and then reblown to look like tumbled stones. So just really do your research. And again, if you have a stone you're not so sure about or something you've heard about, feel free to drop me a chat through my webpage or send me an email. I'd be happy to um, talk with you a little bit more about that. So here was a question. Um, and it says, how do the different substances in the stone affect things? For example, why is amethyst better for specific use as compared to rose quartz? So that's a good question. It kind of ties in with some of what I already referenced. So um, I brought a couple of pieces that I like to work with from time to time. And this is a piece of amethyst. And of course, this is one of those larger pieces that are going to be more likely um, resting on a table. Perhaps you've created part of a crystal grid with it. Um, this particular stone, amethyst, is one of the five quartz family members. So we've got clear quartz, we've got amethyst, we've got smoky quartz, we have um, citrine, which can either be natural or common citrine, which is heat treated. And you know, heat treated citrine, I've talked with you about that before. That's a real crystal, it's been treated, but it's not thick, okay? But the properties have changed. So again, when you're working with citrine on my shop, you'll see that I have two different types of citrine because I wanna reflect the differences between those. And then the fifth um, member of the quartz family is rose quartz, we'll talk about in just a second. So, Amethyst is one of these stones that has really high spiritual frequencies, which means it's going to be connecting up with those upper chakras. It's going to be helping to draw down some of that inspirational energy that we do, of course, know comes from those higher sources. And when we're quiet enough and still enough, perhaps go and sit by some water or sit under a tree or simply watch the birds in the yard, and we allow ourselves to just be really still, that's where we start getting some of those inspirational downloads, so to speak, and amethyst is an example of a stone that can be really helpful. Uh, clear quartz is another really um, very helpful stone when it comes to that. Now, rose quartz, for example, here is um, a form of quartz, it's cryptocrystalline, so microscopically, it has the same internal structure as this one, but you can see, let me hold it up against that yellow, you can see that it's got this termination point. Some quartz will grow in the termination point, others are more likely to be known as cryptocrystalline, which has microscopic um, crystals of quartz. This is really wonderful, again, in this midsection, particularly around the heart chakra. And we don't have to um, always, always be overthinking which stone we want to work with. Go back to the three that are sitting at your home. You go, that's the one I feel like I want to work with today. And so sit with it. 
take that particular stone out under the tree, out by, you know, the garden, watching the squirrels, however you find you yourself to be able to shift into a quiet space. And, you know, it might not be a bad idea to have a little notebook or journal with you so that you can just jot down a few things that may come into your awareness. That's how stones and crystals communicate with us. We are not going to get a real big flash with lots of words to be very subtle. Um, I love the fact that we call our energy field the subtle energy field. It's very, very subtle. It's very veil-like. And that's really what we're doing when we are um, working with energetics from these particular stones. Okay? So I hope that was helpful. Here's another question. Does a stone have to be on your person or can it just be near you? So that's, that's, I like this question because, you know, there are times we definitely want to have a stone in our pocket. We might want to have a stone and slip under our pillowcase at night. Um, I'm very intentional about the stones that I wear. Um, I'm wearing particular stones this evening because of their properties. And I think I'm just going to spend just a second telling you about why I'm wearing them. I find that it's really helpful for me when I am doing this kind of work with a lot of technology and a lot of getting things sorted um, out when it comes to gathering all of the materials, gathering the questions, and being able to be very present that I find I have a lot of support when I work with the element of earth. And so I often will be wearing or working with some kind of earth element gemstone or crystal that will support me with that. So that's why I've chosen to wear amber. Uh, amber is a wonderful stone that resonates with earth energy and stabilizing, yet it's not, um, it's not a super solid rock solid one. It's a very gentle one. There's a flow to it. If we think about amber, for example, you know, it used to be tree sap. And when the tree allowed itself to let that sap just stand still long enough, quiet enough, still enough, and actually transformed. And so I always like to think of that whenever I'm working with amber. And amber is one of my favorite stones to work with. Um, and then I also have on this particular um, bracelet, it just has a lot of different earth element stones. Um, there's ruby and there is um, black tourmaline and there is hematite and um, what else am I missing? A petrified wood. And so those are some, again, earthy stones. And then you'll probably often see me wearing my lapis lazuli um, on one of my wrists. And that is a stone that brings in that higher clarity because while I can speak to my own experience, I can speak, speak to the knowledge I've gained over the years of study in this field, there is still a very large amount of what I share with you that is actually just kind of coming through by me allowing that um, inner guidance to, to come forth as well. And so I hope that's helpful for you when you, un when you understand that there are going to be times you want to carry a stone with you and there are going to be times that you don't need to. So. I actually have two examples of what's known as elite shungite. Now, shungite, I believe I talked about that a couple months ago, and I have another YouTube video about shungite as well. Elite shungite is really helpful in clearing the electromagnetic field of clutter. Um, and so, I often will have a piece near my computer. In fact, this is the piece that sits by my computer. Um, and there are many times I will put this little pendant on. And you can see that it's, it's nothing fancy. It's actually just a cord. This uh, elite shungite is pretty fragile. And so you can't shape it into a lot of different shape. So it's a little hard to always find pendants um, on my list to keep searching for. And so if you were to look for those on my shop, you'd see that I'm currently out of stock. So that would be an example 
Am I going to be in a situation where I want to have that Shungite protection with me in my energy field all the time? Or is this when I'm going to want to have that Shungite protection with me next to my computer so that it is helping to um, clear out my energy field from some of the electromagnetic distortions that come out of all of our electronics? Okay. So that is that question. And I hope that answered that. Um, I had another question that came through. Does the size of the stone matter? Well, yes and no, okay? And so we're gonna explore that a little bit. Uh, I wanna start with a stone that I have another YouTube about. Um, and I'm not sure, honestly, I do so many videos that I'm not sure if I've um, talked a lot about the, Shiva Lingam in the last video or uh, two in the last couple months. But Shiva Lingam is a, a wonderful stone that represents masculine and feminine energies. It represents talent. It is a wonderful representation of um, sacred Hindu um, spirituality. And so when working with a piece of Shiva Lingam, if I want to set this on um, a shelf or maybe a little altar, or maybe I want to use it as a, um, as a, a focal point, maybe in my dining room, I may want a little bit larger one. So what you want to use it for and how it's going to help you is going to be really important. If you're going to be working with a piece of Shiva Lingam for your own personal healing, it may be that um, Shiva this size can be really, really helpful. Um, holding this in your hand, um, perhaps laying down, placing it on uh, your heart or above your head, various um, places sometimes. You may find you'd rather have it in one hand or the other, or maybe over your solar plexus or down at your feet. Um, these are so much more easily worked with than some of these larger pieces. Here's another example of one that, again, you're not going to be able to carry this around. But I want you to be aware of every one of these stones, even though they're all Shivas, they all come from the same family, so to speak. They all have unique signature, energetic signatures, and they're going to um, support you in healing in different ways. So if you are doing a meditation practice with Shiva um, and seeing what Shiva can do to support you and how you're going to work with Shiva in a very much a respectful manner, uh, then make note of what this Shiva is bringing you for insight, for guidance, and for wisdom, and for healing. Make note of what it looks like. You can say, okay, you know, two, four, six, um, maybe a six or seven centimeter by four centimeter spots, and, you know, describe it. Because maybe the next time you pick up a Shiva, you're going to want to work with this one, or maybe one the same size, you're going to have a different experience. Um, you have teeny little Shivas. I like to sometimes carry these in a pocket or wear them in a little cage that I um, can swap out stones. You can work with both of these Shivas and have powerful, powerful healing experiences. And that goes for any of the gemstones. You can have a large piece of amethyst or a very small piece of amethyst, or one even half again or smaller than this, and have very powerful experiences. So size doesn't matter when it comes to connecting with the energetics of the stone and what it has to teach you. I will say, however, that this Shiva is louder than this one. And when we think about the energetic signatures, there's more, there's more. Um, mass to this stone than there is to this. So make sure you're thinking about what do I need? Am I wanting to place, um, and we're just going to stick with Shiva for example, am I wanting to place a piece of Shiva Lingam 
in a little bowl of sand so that it really fills my living room with this energy. Then you, which, which one do you want to work with? Okay. Uh, and the same thing goes if you have a small area um, like with, with my computer. This is great. I do not need a huge chunk of elite shungite. Um, but if I wanted to have a piece of elite shungite to fill the whole space of my, let's say, my upper level, that's, that's going to need a loud stone. So if you think about amplitude, loudness, the amplitude of the energy coming off of these stones varies by size. So in that case, yes, it does matter. But if you are working with, with it for personal healing, it does not really matter. A small piece is um, highly, highly, highly effective. Okay? So I hope that answers that question. Okay, so this is a question that I think um, some of which we've already talked about, some of which I'd like to build upon. And so here is the question. I know that different gemstones can be used for different chakras, and this actually confuses me. I just don't know how to start any ideas. Okay, so there are a couple things embedded within this question. There's a question about working with different kinds of gemstones. So that's a crystal question. There is a question about chakras. That's an energy field question. And then there is this beautiful, honest expression of confusion because we all sometimes just aren't even quite sure what we're supposed to do with the information we've got. So let's take a look at the chakras. Let's take a look at the gemstones and let's at least have a place to start, okay? And so I have brought this piece of selenite and selenite um, is a stone actually that is a very high frequency stone. It's a super soft stone. You don't want to get this wet. It will erode. Um, and it's about a two on a rating of one to 10. And so it's very, very soft. Um, selenite also has the ability to be able to help other gemstones clear and reset themselves. So what I've got here is an example of um, a little, or maybe not so little, uh, piece of selenite with seven different stones that represent the seven different chakras. These are just some of um, the stones that are, all of these are really easily um, found. And so if you're curious, I carry um, little sets. I've bundled together various types of gemstones and crystals that can support different aspects of healing. And one of them is um, the seven chakra. Um, the seven chakra collection that I have. So we're going to look again here. We've got red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, and violet, which you can't see because it's above the camera. Um, so we've got these seven colors and we can work with that and that's a really great way to start. So what I have selected here is for that root chakra, a piece of red jasper. Jasper is a very nurturing stone and depending on the minerals that are part of the um, jasper stone, it is going to have various colors. Jasper is like rose quartz, crystal cryptoline. Microscopically, it is silicon dioxide, and silicon dioxide is um, in all quartz, and quartz is in almost everything in our mineral kingdom. It's about 98% of our Earth's crust is made out of silicon dioxide. So this is the um, red jasper that could be really helpful for supporting that root chakra, which has to do with stability and grounding and um, connection. The second chakra has to do with emotions. And so this is where that emotional energy and the emotional healing is going to be giving birth 
not surprising that word came up, get, being birthed up out of that second chakra. And so that's a center also that's pretty fiery and it's pretty um, um, filled with creative energy. And so for that, a piece of carnelian. Carnelian is another form of silicone dioxide quartz. And it can be, here's a fairly deep orange. It can be almost pale, um, banded with almost a pale white and orange. Um, and they're just beautiful hues that come through. The third chakra is our solar plexus chakra. This is our mental processing. This is where anxiety lands. How we feel about anxiety lands in the second chakra that we just talked about. So here now we've got um, this. Uh, third chakra, which is about mental processing, and it's also about power and empowerment, feeling empowered or dispowered. Um, are we feeling bully or victim? All of those types of sensing um, aspects of how we feel about ourselves and about others lands in that third chakra. And here is a piece of tiger's eye, golden tiger's eye, another form of quartz. A lot of cryptocrystalline quartz in there. Heart chakra, we were talking about green stones earlier, about supporting that heart chakra. Here's an example of green moss agate. Agates are quartz, all right? And so carnelian is an agate and this is an agate. You can see there's a real trend here with having a lot of quartz that is part of many minerals. At the throat chakra, one of the beautiful stones that you could consider working with would be amazonite. It's a stone that resonates with water. It's about fluidly moving and expressing ourselves. And we've all had times when our throat gets really tight when we have to say something important. Maybe we end up coming down with laryngitis either before or right after we've um, just had to say something really super important. So working with a stone such as amazonite can be really helpful for that throat chakra and how we express ourselves, whether it's words, whether it's having a lot of creative energy that starts way down here in that second chakra and now is finally being able to emerge, it's coming up through that, um, that throat. Here's a piece of sodalite. Sodalite, great example here, nice little kind of smooth stone. This is a isometric cubic structured stone at a microscopic level. You don't see it here. So keep in mind that if you were um, working up at this brow chakra, you're working on getting some nice mental clarity, get some insights, and you really want to stabilize that. An example of working with a stone that's both has those blue colors of the brow and also that um, kind of solid, stable energy of that cube, of that isometric structure. Photolite would be a great example. And then at the top, we have a piece of amethyst. This one happens to be tumbled. Remember, it's a part of the quartz family. It's going to have these same terminations. We just can't see them because they've been all polished up. Um, but they'll still have that particular pattern and these Terminations are all formed the way that um, the way all of those internal structures kind of line up around one particular access point. So this is an example of how you could work with stones for different chakras, um, knowing that you're working with colors. Yeah, you do have to just begin to do some exploring around what chakra energy is about. You know, you can take a look out on my online school. The link is below this video um, if you're viewing on YouTube. And I do have courses in both energy healing and crystal healing. And I also offer some free mini courses that you might find helpful as you're sorting through those questions. Whoops. And of course, my little guys move because they like to slide. And when we get back to um, the size matter, here's another example of a very small little stone um, layout that I've created on a small piece of selenite. This actually typically is sitting in my healing office right on my desk. And so this is an example of how you can 
have small pieces of stone still offer quite a bit of powerful insight and energy, okay? Um, there was a question I'm just seeing that pop. What is Shiva good for? Okay, I'm going to revisit that. Um, so Shiva represents balance. It represents this um, feminine energy of the egg. It also has um, an energy of that more masculine phallic energy. And so it really brings a, a balanced energy into our energy field when we're choosing to work with it. I like to think of it as the fact that it has a connection with the earth and a connection with heaven. And when when I have Shiva either um, in my home or in my office, um, on display, I have them in a dish sitting in some sand so that they sit upright, and that allows that that vertical flow of energy from the earth up to the heavens, from the heavens down to the earth, to be able to really move very well. The other thing that I think reminds me of our chakra column is that we have. Um, this heart chakra that sits right in the middle of our chakra column. So let's just, I'm going to take this little, little um, chakra. And they're all, I have little putty under them. And you know what? Putty is okay. It's okay if you put a little piece of tape or a little putty or something like that to help your stones um, stay in place. And so I've got red jasper. I have got carnelian, I have a piece of yellow jasper, I have a piece of uh, green aventurine, I have a piece of dyed howlite, I have a piece of amethyst, and then I have a piece of clear quartz way up here, which is really hard to dis uh, differentiate right now with the camera and the lighting. So, um, so if you look here right at that green one, representing that heart chakra, you have these three above and these three below, and that heart is the balance point. So now we're gonna go back to Shiva, I'll grab this one. So when we have Shiva displayed in our home, displayed in our bedroom, displayed somewhere, or when we work with Shiva, it helps us consciously, make that connection between heaven and earth. And then it also helps us to do the energetic work. Uh, slowly, as we do healing work, whether it is with crystal healing, energetic healing, meditation, any kind of self-care practice, is going to slowly help some of the, the wisdom and the guidance and the intuitive understanding that we have within us, slowly those begin to become more um, aware, uh, we become more aware of them at a conscious level. But first they have to start higher and very slowly they settle down into, um, into those aha moments, those experiences that, that give us some a sense of um, how to be able to embrace the shifts that are occurring. Okay, we have time for one more question and I'm going to address it now because it came through, but I do want to revisit it um, next month a little bit more deeply. So here is the question, what are gem elixirs and gem waters and how do you make one? All right, so we're, I'm going to talk about gem waters really quickly because that is one I will um, I can teach you very quickly. Um, it's part of my crystal healer certification program in, a, in my advanced crystal healing course, um, a person does learn how to make um, gem elixirs and gem essences. And so what you will want to do is you're going to need a bowl, you're gonna need a glass jar, labels off, so there are no words, then you're gonna to wanna to have some water, and I'm right-handed, so I'm gonna move the water over here. The idea is that we're not going to be putting 
or rocks directly into the water that we want to drink. So a gem water is um, water that has been infused with the energetics of stones. So I have a piece of sunstone that supports the third chakra. I have a piece of serpentine that is a wonderful stone that brings up earth energy and twists it up through our chakra system. And then I have a piece of rutilated quartz. Now, rutilated quartz is a piece of quartz that also has rutile in it. And so it can be really helpful for jump starting and, um, and um, strengthening uh, uh, any kind of stone that it's working with. So I'm simply putting those stones in here and I am pouring water around, please note, around. Now, what I'm going to do, I'm going to take this upstairs, I'm going to put it in my refrigerator, and I'm going to cover it up with saran wrap, and I'm going to leave it sit overnight. In the morning, I will have water that has received some of the energetics of those properties of those stones, yet I have received that energetic imprint from the stones into the water in a way that's safe. So this piece of malachite, you may say, well, yeah, this looks fine. It's nice and, you know, it's polished. It's not going to rub off. Well, you know, it's got a big gash on the back. I love this one. But this, I don't want to put in any water and drink it. There are, there are toxic stones, and a lot of stones just really are not meant to be actually ingested internally. And so this is what I would say if you really want to explore working with a gem water, do it just this way. Empty jar, put your stones in, pour water around it, cover it up with saran wrap, put it in the refrigerator overnight, and then the next day drink it. There's no, you know, there's no um, uh, purification, there's no uh, preservative in there. In fact, here, let me reach, use my reach. If you wanted to, you could put in a little drop of organic apple cider vinegar, but you don't have to because you're drinking it right away. But anyway, I wanted to tell you about that um, because that question came in and I really felt like that could be a really good, good, simple way for you to take another look at how you can work with gemstones. Um, but just, just that's all. Okay, I don't want you doing more of that. Um, a great question. Wow. We had a lot of diversity in the questions that came through and still this common thread of how do we make the connection between our energetic body, our physical body, our emotional body, our spiritual body? How do we make the connection with the crystals and still not get too confused about it? And so I hope that you have found that um, to be helpful. Just as wrap up, Next month, um, I've got the date here. It's going, we're going to be doing this again Thursday, September 15th from 6 to 7 p.m. So mark your calendars, get your questions in. Um, I do try to put out some reminders um, uh, on social media and then also through my newsletter and on my online um, or on my web page. Uh, there will always be a link to a, a video either to watch the Zoom or to watch the YouTube that you can access. Uh, again, you can reach out to me by visiting my website, uh, Fourth Dimension Healing, www.4dimensionhealing.com. You can email me. The links are below the YouTube video. I really am so grateful for the way that these questions come in. And they're, they're not only really great questions, but wow, they are showing me that you're really taking this, this crystal healing seriously and you want to do it well and you want to um, really understand it uh, through your experience as well as through your um, knowledge that you gain from reading books or watching videos or doing courses as well. So anyway, if you have any other questions, please don't hesitate to reach out to me. For now, I want to send you many blessings. Be well.